It's my great pleasure to start this seminar and welcome our guest. Uh, our guest, Alu Lakshmi Narayan, comes from India. But maybe you might know there is such a place called Chennai, and there is Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, which is located in Chennai. Of course, you know the, the, the um, name has changed. We know Madras T. But now the city of Madras is not called Madras anymore. It's third change name into Chennai. But the institute still has the old name Madras. So I will work on random matrices, quantum chaos, dynamical systems, but also about quantum entanglement. And now he'll tell us something about entanglement transitions in coupled chaotic systems and in relation to random matrix theory. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Carol, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and also the introduction to my uh, institute and uh, city. And actually, every time uh, Madras comes up, Carol tells me that uh, that's what it's known for. And yes, that's uh, tea, I guess, was an important part of the commerce from that part of the uh, country. So Chennai is really in the southern state of Tamil Nadu. It's on this coast. It's the Bay of Bengal. And tea has really grown more interior in the hilly regions. Chennai is a pretty hot place. Tea doesn't grow there. But yeah, so I saw this the other day at the supermarket, and I downloaded this uh, picture. So. so but we don't get Madras tea in Madras, OK? We, we get everything else except Madras tea. So uh, yeah, but my institute is still called Indian Institute of Technology Madras. The university there is still University of Madras. But Chennai, I think it, the city was always known as Chennai uh, by the uh, local population. So it became Chennai maybe some 15 years ago. So uh, my collaborators in this work are Shashi Srivastava, who is uh, faculty at this center, which is a variable electron cyclotron center. So he has to justify doing entanglement and chaos there. But that's what he's doing. He's there. Stephen Tomsovic, who has worked for long on uh, quantum chaos, random matrix theory, and uh, nuclear spectra, and so on, semi-classical theory, and Anne Baker and Roland Ketzmerich from TU Dresden, who are also uh, have have worked on uh, uh, many aspects of quantum chaos. So my primary interest here is in uh, presenting some work of ours on what I call entanglement transitions. As I go on, I'll make that clear. And uh, most of this work, I think, is published, except for some realizations about power loss. So I'll, I'll come to that as I go by. OK, so roughly, that's the outline of my talk. Uh, my talks usually end about half the slides. So it's 3 by 30. We'll see how it goes. So introduction. So I'll state what problem we are really interested in. And a brief review of entanglement for those of you who are not entangled with it in the simplest context of pure bipartite states. This would be completely standard uh, material, but perhaps a little bit of uh, slightly different insights uh, than available, maybe, hopefully. And then I'll talk about this uh, transition parameter, what is really the uh, the parameter which is driving a transition, and a little bit about spectral statistics. And then I'll come to the central players, namely the eigenstate of such coupled systems, the entropy, which we will also interpret as uh, entanglement, and perturbation theory. So we, we're going to do perturbation theory on this uh, and try to estimate the entanglement using perturbation theory but in a particular setting, which I will make clear as, we, as I go by, and how, because of perturbation theory, there emerges uh, power loss and uh, uh, things like a levy stable distributions. And then I will talk about various moments. This might be a bit ambitious. Let's see how it goes. And then go into non-perturbative regimes, which then go into random matrix theory and summarize. So that's the idea. Please feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, so the problem statement is rather, looks rather general, that we have two systems, or if you wish, subsystems. We used to argue a lot whether to call it systems or subsystems. But let's call them two systems, A and B. 
And you have some Hamiltonian describing system A and system B. It's separable. They're not interacting. So that's simply HA plus HB, a very common situation, of course. If you were to think in terms of unitary operators, uh, then uh, Hermitian or Hamiltonians, it's a tensor product of two unitary operators belonging to system A and system B. There's no interaction. For example, you could think of time evolution. So e to the power of i h is of this form. So time evolution operators, propagators, or Floquet operators, all of that in the, in the unseparable. Of course, the eigenstates of such a Hamiltonian or unitary operator can be chosen to be unentangled. So psi a belongs to the eigen, or eigenvectors of h a, psi b eigenvectors of h b. So it's unentangled. Unentangled simply means that it's you can associate a pure state to each of these subsystems. We are only considering pure states at this point. Is there yeah. a linguistic difference between unentangled and independent? Sorry? Is there any difference between unentangled and independent? <laughs> yes. In a more general context, yes, but not in the case of pure states. In the case of pure states, it is so just far, the same. So far, it's linguistic. A, a linguistic difference? No. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yes, yes. Separable, yes. Maybe I should say that separable and entangled at this point is the same. Yeah, yeah. So now what is it that we want to do? Uh, we want to introduce small uh, interactions to begin with. We'll make that large, of course. So that's why all the fun and games begin. So we have an interaction and we can also introduce interactions in the uh, unitary context by putting in an operator UAB, which is not of that product form. Then naturally, the eigenvectors of H or U now will get entangled. And the question is, by how much, of course? How much and how does it depend on the interaction, namely epsilon, and other relevant quantities, perhaps? So it's a rather general question. That's what we're interested in. We cannot solve it in its uh, complete generality, but we will, s we will solve it in a particular context. Or rather, we claim that we can say something useful about it in some particular context. So entanglement, just a mini tutorial for uh, over a few uh, slides, um, uh, and also to set the language. So the whole. So Schrodinger actually, I think, put it beautifully as the whole is in a definite state, but the parts are not. And uh, uh, so here is a very simple uh, and a very canonical example of a singlet state. So you can consider this as two spins up, down, minus, down, up. It's impossible to find pure states belonging to uh, system one and two alpha and beta such that this is true. So it's a canonical example of not only an entangled state, it's actually a maximally entangled state. And it forms the central object of, uh, uh, of, of entanglement and, uh, and of paradoxes due, or apparent paradoxes due to EPR uh, about uh, realism, localism, etc. is just discussed because of the property of entanglement being at the center of, uh, uh, center of quantum mechanics. Entanglement is quite different from superposition. Of course, it arises because of superposition, but it's not just superposition. As you can see here, this is a very completely superposed state of everything, but it's not an entangled state because it's simply a product state of, uh, of these two. In general, if you're given a pure state of a two-state system, so that there are four things here, or qubits, then uh, there is a, you can, of course, find conditions uh, on these coefficients so that the state is unentangled. In the case of qubits, actually, the condition is rather simple to derive. And it's simply that this determinant of a matrix of coefficients, um, thanks. I'm especially indebted to Antonio for lending me his computer. Antonio. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so in terms of a matrix of coefficients, A0, 1, you just make a two by two matrix out of these coefficients, 
then if the determinant is zero, it's unentangled, but otherwise it's entangled. So, but in general, what is the condition? So a bit of mathematics may be here, but it's completely straightforward and uh, completely uh, standard. It's there in textbooks. So we consider the setting of two Hilbert spaces, dimensionality n and m. In general, n can be smaller than or equal to m. We write a general pure state, which belongs to this product system. And these are the coefficients which generalize those a0, 0, et cetera. And there are totally n into m coefficients here. So the state has n into m. And these are basis states which are orthogonal. I forms an orthonormal basis set. Alpha forms an orthonormal basis set. Maybe this is a better position to stand. So we can construct a matrix A, uh, uh, which is an n cross m matrix of coefficients here. OK, so now the, uh, the state of system A, the individual subsystem A, is given by tracing out the uh, uh, subsystem B. There is a proper uh, operational understanding of this procedure. But basically, we are tracing out the subsystem B, and we get a state of A. So if, there is an, uh, uh, if, if one has access only to subsystem A, then they have access only to this state, not to this full state. And so it's just mathematics from this point. You can just put in a complete set of uh, basis states in B and trace it out. And you see that this density matrix has a nice structure in terms of this matrix A, rectangular matrix A. It's simply a, a dagger where this is their joint operator. So the density matrix is manifestly positive. And it's a square matrix, unlike this matrix here, rectangular matrix. So it's n cross n. Positive matrix as any uh, self-respecting state of quantum mechanics has to be. And similarly, if you trace out the subsystem B, it is almost A dagger A, just an interchange of these two, except for this transpose operation. So this is an m cross m matrix. So just from the structure here, you can see that the eigenvalues of row A and row B are the same. So if they come from a pure state, the individual subsystems have the same spectrum. So this has actually interesting consequences. And uh, 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 but before that, let me just state that uh, this the state psi AB is unentangled if and only if either of these subsystems is a pure state. Because if it, is a, uh, because if it can be written as a product state, a product of two pure states, then tracing out one of them will make the other one still just be a pure state. So as long as row A and row B are not pure states, if one is not a pure state, the other cannot be a pure state, then psi AB is entangled. So that's a very simple characterization of how a general bipartite pure state has a uh, description in terms of how, how do we an algorithm for finding out if it's entangled or not. Now, these are positive matrices, as I said. And because they have the structure of A, A dagger, A dagger, A, they have the same eigenvalues. So the spectrum is the same. So these are positive numbers. And because it's a density matrix, the trace of this is 1. So we have these lambdas are really like probabilities. They are lying between 0 and 1. And they add up to 1. And these are eigenvectors of these density matrices. They need not be the same, but they form an orthogonal set. So this gives us one of the uh, basic, uh, uh, basic uh, uh, constructions out of which a lot of quantum information theory relies. And that's the Schmidt decomposition of this general bipartite pure state. It can be written in terms of the a, a, a sum of only n terms rather than n into m. So it's a very compressed form of writing this bipartite state, but still an orthonormal basis which is unentangled. Only this orthonormal basis is not some arbitrary basis. It, they come from the eigenvectors, the basis of the density matrices. So rho j a is the same rho j a. And the eigenvalues being the same, there's just square root of these eigenvalues which come here. So you see, the uh, why is this a nice, uh, uh, 
way? OK or OK? Thanks. So why is this a nice uh, it, it, it way is that you can see immediately the correlations which are present in this. Because they are autonomous, if you were to measure, say, phi j a, you know for sure that the other state is phi j b. Because this is the up here. Yes, yes. Uh, but n. So this this here but is is the smaller of the system A and B. Absolutely. So that's a good question. So the thing is that n is smaller than. So we choose our n to be the smaller of the two. So the other eigenvalues are all zero. Yeah, because the other things are all zero. See the uh, because they have the same spectrum, but they have different dimensionalities. So uh, so m being larger, the other eigenvalues are all zero. So they don't contribute to the construction of the state. Yes. So by the way, I mean, the, the mathematics behind this is a singular value decomposition. So it's as uh, 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 simple as uh, that. It's a singular value decomposition of this matrix A, or principal component analysis. I believe it's called in several different ways. So the, OK, so that's the Schmidt decomposition. It will form a central object in our analysis. So uh, to reiterate, every pure bipartite state has a Schmidt decomposition, which is an optimal way of writing the, uh, uh, writing the bipartite state. I'll also say what it means in a minute. Uh, and all the coefficients are positive numbers, uh, which are these eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, essentially square root of them. So, we can not only use it to define the fact that it's entangled, but we can also measure the entanglement by using various measures. So one of the most common, and I believe uh, uh, most uh, motivated, uh, 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 most motivated uh, uh, definition is in terms of the phenomenon entropy of these reduced density matrices. Because they come from a parent pure state, the spectrum is the same, and therefore it doesn't matter whether you calculate the phenomenon entropy of rho A or rho B, it's all equal, and that's the entanglement of system A with system B. And B or B with A or A to B it doesn't matter. That's simply the, given by this. And it's zero for unentangled states because if the state is unentangled, there's only one term in the Schmidt decomposition. That's the beauty of the Schmidt decomposition. If we go back to this elementary example here, this does this is not a Schmidt decomposed form because these two are not orthogonal to each other; they are identical. But this is a Schmidt decomposed form. And uh, uh, b there is only one term in this, when there's only one term in the Schmidt decomposition. So that shows that this is an unentangled uh, state. So only one of these eigenvalues is one, everything else is zero, which means that one of these states is pure. So uh, uh, actually, both of them will be pure in that case. So uh, lambda i, one, let's say the largest eigenvalue is lambda one is one, everything else is zero, so this is zero. So it's zero if and only if actually the states are unentangled. And it is log n, on the other hand, for maximally entangled states. So a maximally entangled state can be written essentially as some combination like this, with all of these lambda j's being equal. So it's equal to one over square root of n. So that's a maximally entangled state. And in fact, the other example which I gave here, which I started with, the singlet example, is a maximally entangled state. This is already a Schmidt decomposed form, although there is here a negative sign, which can be absorbed into the definition of one of these states. So there is the, the, the lambdas are simply 1 over square root of 2. And this is orthogonal to this. This is orthogonal to this. So it's already essentially Schmidt decomposed. So that's an example of a maximally entangled state. But there are other entropy measures which are easy to work with, easier to work with, let's say, analytically. Uh, one of them is the linear, so-called linear entropy, which is 1 minus the trace of rho squared rather than uh, trace of rho log rho. So clearly, it's a simpler quantity without a logarithms and so on. So 1 minus sum of lambda j squared. You can use a lot of other moments. We will, I will generalize this. So just to point out some interpretations of what the Schmidt decomposition means geometrically. 
So here is a general state, psi AB, that's the Schmidt decomposition. We'll arrange these, I, these lambdas in a decreasing order, so lambda 1 is always my largest, and they are like probabilities, they sum up to 1. So one of the properties is that if we, take, if we ask, okay, here is a bipartite entangled state, possibly entangled state, in the Hilbert space, what is the closest unentangled state? Then the answer is actually the first of these states, so phi 1a, phi 1b. This is the closest unentangled state. So there is a, a definite meaning for this largest eigenvalue. It really doesn't matter, but you can take a Euclidean distance. All of the metrics are equivalent as long as they are, they are what's it called? They're all equivalent uh, metrics. So you can, you can take a... Uh, uh, pure states. Pure states, yes, yes. Pure states. Class, exactly. If you take right. Uh, right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Is this, uh, what's the technical term for the all the metrics? What's the usual? Study, but this is like all met, uh, metrics which are topologically equivalent to Fubini study. Right. right. Yeah. That kind so of standard metric. Uh, well, related like to geodesic distance at complex projective manifold. Topologically equivalent to this. I don't believe it. Okay, so maybe it could, it could be, yeah, it's. Let me uh, put it in uh, other words, metric. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, if you can uh, estimate one metric with another. And what about the Kulbach Leibler? Aha, <coughs> metric. <coughs> yes, yes, yes. This okay. Yeah, I, I think all of them are equivalent. So, this, this will, of course, the distance will be different. I think it's a use the Kulbach metric. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so in fact, I just, I, I, I want to emphasize that this distance is related to the largest eigenvalue, okay? So for example, one minus lambda one would be, it's a function of yeah, it's a, it's a function of this. It's a function of this number, for example, yeah, one of these things. So if, if lambda one is one, for example, then it's an unentangled state and the distance is zero already. So the, uh, we'll, 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 we'll come across this, uh, uh, the simple one minus lambda one again. But the point is that the largest eigenvalue of the reduced density matrix has a meaning and it's a nice uh, interpretation in terms of this. One can also ask a complementary question which seems to be less uh, sort of, this one for example you can find in the book of Perez where he, uh, I think, uh, Introduction to Quantum Theory of Concepts, Asher Perez's book, where he derives the Schmidt decomposition essentially by posing this question. What is the smallest, what is the closest unentangled state? But this seems to be slightly less uh, visible. The question is, given an uh, entangled state, a pure entangled state, what is the closest maximally entangled states? After all, there exists a whole set of maximally entangled states. What is the closest maximally entangled states? And again, the Schmidt decomposition has a very nice answer to that. It says, replace all of these lambda j's by equal numbers, one over square root of n, use the eigenvectors of this, this is, in fact, the state which is a maximally entangled state, which is closest to a closest to this given state psi AB with that Schmidt decomposition. So these are two different phases, and the distance to this is now governed by a different metric, which is now the square root of the eigenvalues. Clearly, this one here. You can just take an inner product of that with that, and you get this. So the this is now governed by this. So not only are the combinations of, so what I want to emphasize is that this combination of these lambdas, the von Neumann entropy, or the linear entropy are interesting objects, but also this square root of lambda j, which is much less studied, I think. Okay, so that's uh, my introduction of, uh, of, uh, of the kind of entanglement that is needed uh, for my second half of the talk, and I will now go into the 
uh, the uh, the setting which I the problem setting which I put in before. But before getting into the perturbative regime, I want to go to the opposite extreme of uh, saying something about, but not much, but saying something about what happens if you have already very strongly coupled chaotic systems. So although I have put a picture of a uh, pendulum, okay, maybe this is also a valid uh, thing. I mean, a double pendulum is a classic, classical example of a classical chaos. So if you were to quantize this and look at eigenvectors, for example, eigenstates, excited eigenstates of the double pendulum, what kind of entanglement would we expect? So, uh, uh, although the Hilbert spaces here are strictly not finite dimensional, but let's cons we can also deal with that. But let's say that we have finite dimensional spaces just as we had before, N and M. It's uh, uh, quite interesting that the expected entanglement in the eigenstates is very close to, this equal to has to be taken with as in the region of the average entanglement calculated over the states. So the har average over all the pure states. So this was uh, calculated by Don Page with very different motivations from black holes. So he was asking what's the average subsystem entropy of a random state. And he conjectured this formula, a precise formula for the for Neumann entropy average. And uh, uh, this was proven later using random matrix theory. So this in the limit of large dimensionality n, m is larger than n, so that's already larger than that, it goes as log n minus n by twice m. So asymptotically, that's the formula. So for example, if n is, so if n is equal to m, you have log n minus half. You remember that log n is a maximum possible entanglement. So the average is very close to the maximum possible. And the claim is that if you have very strongly interacting chaotic systems, then the average expected entanglement in the eigenstates is almost as large as the maximum. So it's log n minus half. There was earlier work by uh, Elihu Lubkin who looked at the linear entropy and he had uh, a, a similar, he had a formula which he proved for the linear entropy and the same kind of qualitative results followed from there. So this is uh, what I would call the other extreme because you have strong interaction and entanglement. And quite interestingly, of late, there's been a lot of work related to many body systems uh, in the so called uh, many body localization literature. For example, I've taken a paper by Jal Bardasan and Polman who looked at actually this Hamiltonian, which is an icing model but with next nearest neighbor interaction as well. Without this, it's an integrable model, it's a transverse icing model. So, I'm sorry, okay, yes, that's right. It's transverse icing, but there is a disorder in this uh, sigma, Z, uh, sigma Z coupling. So they looked at this as a non-integrable model, and then they varied the disorder strength in this delta J, in, in this Ji, that is their delta Ji. I'm just taking this. Yeah, it's a one-dimensional chain of L cube, L spins. Now, spin half particles, so we think of it as qubits. And what they are calculating is, Really, they split the spin chain into two parts, and they're calculating the entanglement in the eigenstates, excited states, of one half of the spin chain with the other. They're calculating this average of that over many realizations. They are, that's what this average is. It's an average over many realizations as well as many eigenstates, excited states. And they are plotting that as a function of this delta J, which is the width of the disorder in this uh, thing. So what you can see is actually that for large disorder strengths, the entanglement entropy is small, which sort of makes sense because this is going to dominate large entanglement. So it will be actually unentangled. And, but as this disorder strength uh, variance is decreasing, it becomes non-integrable and its entropy increases. So these are for, I guess, different uh, system sizes L. Yeah, that's uh, different system sizes L, or the number of qubits. And these dotted lines are from this page value, if you wish, this, this, this value here. And what you can see is that it reaches this page value. So this is the so-called volume law, and this is a area law. So entanglement goes from something which is almost zero to something which is nearly maximal. 
So this is a first example of an entanglement transition which I wish to talk about here. So I will call this an entanglement transition as a function of some parameter. Essentially it's going from unentangled to maximally entangled. And exactly how this happens is I think largely unknown. Another, well, maybe I don't have time to discuss this, but there has been a recent experiment, if you wish to, uh, uh, which also looks at entanglement in isolated quantum systems, but here are just three qubits, and I believe Marek Kush and uh, uh, Carol have worked a lot with uh, kick tops. And uh, 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 so this was an experimental realization of uh, uh, three uh, qubits, which are, so basically this is just one large spin, but you can look at it as a collection of spin half particles. So they, they look at it as a collection of three spin half particles and uh, they implement this kick top. So kick top is a classic example of a transition between chaos, uh, integrable and, uh, uh, and chaos. And what they find in their experiments is again, these are time evolving states, these are not eigenstates, they, they would start off. So this picture for example is time average of this entanglement and this is phase space. So they would start off a state from this point in phase space, a coherent state, and then they will evolve it in time and measure the entanglement by measuring actually the state. They do a full state tomography and they find this entanglement. So blue is large entanglement, red is small, and their claim is that you can see a correspondence between classical uh, phase space structures. Let's look at this picture. Here there is chaos and there is larger entanglement. Here there is more regular dynamics and there is smaller in time. And then they make some statements about thermalization and so on, which is a bit debatable, but it appears in nature physics, so you can't debate, uh, well, it's, it's fine. I mean, it it's, has to be correct, okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, my, uh, I, just, I just want to emphasize that there are also some interesting experiments uh, uh, which are uh, trying to uh, uh, explore this strongly coupled regime as well as transitions to entanglement. I believe actually in this experimentally it's difficult to push it to parameters where there is full chaos. It's an experimental, uh, it's experimentally hard. So they couldn't go to a regime where there was really the full uh, random matrix value of log n minus half, but even here I believe it comes fairly close to that value. Okay, so to, uh, uh, to again formalize the question more formally now after that sort of rambling introduction. So we have in mind something which is a separable to interacting system. The entanglement entropy, however you measure it, goes from zero at zero coupling to strong coupling it goes towards a random matrix value, let's say log n minus half. Question is how does this happen? In general, integrable, non-integrable transitions such as this coupled top is actually complicated by special non-universal features of integrable dynamics, the well-known kolmogorov arnold moser theorem, breakup of tori and phase space, etc. It's a fairly, I think, involved and probably non-universal transition. The other kind of systems, I showed you one example of disordered many-body systems. There is a lot of interest, but as far as I know, no general theories of entanglement transitions across many-body localized. So this is the small uh, a, a entanglement, the so-called area law, to ergodic phases where you have a volume law. So I, I, I believe that no general theories are known. So the purpose of this talk is this third scenario where really we have a non-interacting to interacting transition, but where all limits are non-integrable. Even the non-interacting limit is chaotic. So for instance, uh, uh, what kind of examples may be there? Well, we can think of, for example, single particles in a potential which is already such that the single particle dynamics is chaotic. This is a very common situation, really. And if you have two such particles in it, you already have a situation like that. For example, you take billiards. Billiards are well-known examples of uh, uh, just free particle motion which becomes chaotic because of the boundary conditions. So you can take two particles, let's say in uh, Bunimovich billiard or something, which is a stadium billiard, and they are interacting particles. Again, you have a scenario where the single particle dynamics is already chaotic and complicated, and of course the interaction only aids that complexity even more. 
If you think in terms of spin chains, you can think of two non-integrable spin chains which are starting to interact maybe in a ladder-like configuration. So one can think of various scenarios where this is, is obtained. But as far as uh, the theory is concerned, this seems to be one of the simplest uh, scenarios. So one of the examples which we would do, because we can do this really easily, is a case where we take something like a pendulum, but we already kick it so that it's chaotic, and then we couple it to another such chaotic pendulum. So it's not exactly just the canonical double pendulum, because the canonical double pendulum you have each of the pendula is not, is not chaotic. Uh, but here, the, each of the pendulum is chaotic because it's already, there is a forcing on it. So this is a very standard system again, textbook material. Here we have a kick pendulum. So the kicking is through this periodic time dependence in it. That's simply the, uh, without this, the usual pendulum Hamiltonian. But this leads to a map that is a uh, mapping of QP to Q prime P prime, which is given by this after this integer times T. So this is the kick to kick dynamics. So it changes position momentum according to this. And according to this K value, we obtain very interesting phase space, standard Lichtenberg, Lieberman, or one of the standard books on chaos will uh, deal with this. For example, k equal to zero is a case of really free motion. This is momentum plotted here, and this is the angle q or theta. I've mentioned it as theta here. This is q. So this is momentum and angle, and it's just constant momentum case. And when k is 0.3, you see something that looks like a normal pendulum phase space, but is actually different because this is not a flow, but it's a map. And you can see here the hyperbolic uh, point and the elliptic fixed points. This looks like a phase space pendulum. In fact, it, it's pretty much close to that. But as we increase k further, this is when k is 1, you can see a lot of chaos which is there around the separatrix, which develops here. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is a mixed phase space dynamics. Most of the motion is uh, regular but there is also some chaos. As you increase it further, chaos increases in volume till at k equal to seven, it completely succumbs to chaos. So this is in fact a completely chaotic system. Qu the quantization is very simple because it's just a floquet operation. So I mean, in between the kicks, it's just free particle. And during the kick, it's just this. So rather than a Hamiltonian being p squared plus cos q, now it is exponential of one multiplied by the exponential of the other. So this is the quantization of the system. So what we do is we couple two of them, two standard maps together. So there are two parameters for the individual ones. We will keep both of them to be very large so that we are already in a chaotic situation. And then we couple them together with a parameter b. And we quantize this. We get a unitary operator which is now these are the individual uh, uh, individual kicked rotors, Hamiltonian, and this is the interaction. So these are n cross n matrices, where n is actually interpreted. I mean, it's, it's, it's really 1 over the effective h in the uh, problem of the Planck constant in quantum maps. So the classical limit is when these matrix sizes go to infinity, n goes to infinity. So I actually studied this first. In 2001, in the context of entanglement, Richter and the uh, TU Dresden group, they have a very elaborate study of both the classical and aspects of the quantum more recently. You can see some very nice work in 2014 from that group. OK, so that's just the example which I will be using. Now, we have the scenario where we have two strongly chaotic systems which are starting to interact. How do we measure this interaction? Or what is the effect, eff effectively, what is it that controls this interaction? It turns out that there is a work which goes back to nuclear physics, or probably even earlier, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, Steve Tomsovic, who's part of our uh, collaboration, uh, uh, brought this uh, 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 very neat and simple understanding to this, that what governs the transition is the ratio of v squared by d squared, where v 
V square is the mean square average of the interaction of diagonal matrix elements in the unperturbed basis. So basically, we have an unperturbed system. We look at its basis, and we look at the transition matrix elements of the interaction in terms of the unperturbed basis. And we look at the off-diagonal elements, and the mean square of that is an important quantity which comes here, which is actually measuring basically the transition strengths, right? And D is mean level spacing of the unperturbed system. So it tells you how closely the energy is up. I will, I will motivate this in a minute using perturbation theory, but the point is actually this is not really perturbation theory. Uh, it's perturbation theory motivated, but its uh, uh, validity seems to be beyond perturbation theory, as I will uh, also point out. So in terms of the standard map, I've put in here this coupling parameter B. Without B, it'll be two uncoupled standard maps. With B, it becomes coupled standard maps. These are really, speaking, four-dimensional symplectic objects, so it's symplectic maps. It's slightly hard to visualize. That's what this Richter group did to try to visualize it. Uh, I mean, we can't draw those kind of simple face space pictures. So what actually governs the transition is not just B, but the combination n to the power 4 b square, or n square b. So this is an effective parameter, which n is now the system size. So uh, for example, here, I show how this thing works by plotting the nearest neighbor uh, level spacing statistics. So we look at the eigenvalues of this coupled uh, unitary operator, and we ask for the uh, spacing distribution between the eigenvalues or eigenangles. And what we will see is actually there is, when there is no coupling, although the systems are individually chaotic, the level spacing statistics is Poissonian. Poissonian means that two levels can come very close to each other. So that's what happens, although the subsystems are chaotic. So this is a bit of an, uh, maybe when one first sees it as a, is a bit uh, odd because Chaotic systems or non-integrable systems are supposed to have a spacing distribution which is Wigner, and it's got level repulsion. But on the other hand, if you just have two non-interacting chaotic systems, their level statistics is Poisson. This was also worked out in great mathematical detail by, uh, in fact, uh, two, of, two of them belong this, to this institute, Marek Kush and uh, Karol Shish Shishkowski where they prove that in the epsilon equal to zero or the interaction-less case, this is actually Poissonian. But now if you turn on the interactions, there is a transition from Poisson to this Wigner. So you can see that it's, uh, uh, these are for different interactions and uh, it, it immediately goes, it's actually a, a, a discontinuous transition. You have immediately level repulsion and then you have, uh, you have a transition which goes from Poisson to Wigner. And what is the parameter which determines this transition is not just b, but b times n squared. So that's what this graph is showing, that there are different values of b and n. S smaller b, a small b, so here this is b and n. So now this is a larger value of b, smaller value of n, and even more larger, smaller value of n. So the, really the effective, all of them fall into one curve one intermediate statistics curve. So what determines this transition is not just this interaction B, but B times N square. So it's important to identify the transition parameter given any interaction system, interacting system. This is the first lesson. So this was a work which appeared fairly recently. And I want to show that actually it's the same parameter which also governs entanglement transitions. So again, if B is zero, so what do we do? We take this unitary operator corresponding to these two coupled standard maps as an example. This is just an example, I want to emphasize that. And we look at its eigenstates. So phi i are some eigenstates. Um, there should be a bracket here. So this is an eigenvalue, which is on the unit circle. But we are really interested in these eigenfunctions now. These eigenvalues is what I talked about now, but eigenfunctions. So we look at, again, the trace, we look at the subsystem density matrix of this eigenstates, and we look at its eigenvalues, the lambda j, and we calculate various entropies. So you see, I have now 
calculated this general SK, which is lambda j to the power of k divided by k minus 1, also called the Salis entropy, or Haudra Sharvat Salis entropy. Thank you. So, uh, uh, but these are generalizations, and you can see for k equals 2, this is the linear entropy. k equals 1, it's a 0 by 0 form as a limit, it's the von Neumann entropy. So, both the von Neumann entropy, the linear entropy, are special cases of this family of entropies. So, we calculate this entropy for each eigenstate, and then we average it over the spectrum. And then we look at it as a function of this interaction strength, and we obtain this curve. So, if the interaction strength is zero, this is actually now the scaled interaction strength of the transition parameter. Of course, everything is zero, however chaotic it may be. But as we turn on the interactions, we see that there is this uh, uh, curve here, and this is the von Neumann entropy case. So, this is for k equals one. There is an increase, and we are dividing this average by something here, which is actually the random matrix value log n minus half relevant to this von Neumann entropy. So, it tends towards 1. So, when it tends towards 1, it means that it's going towards a random matrix uh, value or highly strongly coupled value. So, there is this nice smooth transition. And here, the actually, this curve is a theoretical curve. And these uh, circles are uh, uh, belong to the standard map uh, thing. So, it's a fairly decent fit. There are some deviations here, but it's a fairly decent fit to a theory which is based on perturbation theory. And this is for the linear entropy. It gets better for larger k. So, for linear entropy, this is for 3 and for 4. You can see that the transition is pretty well controlled, and all of these are theoretical curves. They are very simple curves, really. This one. So, the von Neumann is the slowest transition along with uh, for k equals 1 to, I mean, k greater than or equal to 1. Conditions, uh, old-fashioned physics. As Correct. You say. Correct. The entropy, for example, yeah. extensivity. Exactly. Yeah. And, so, uh, so, can I draw yeah. any conclusion about the, the entanglement and the extensivity of? I mean, the not really. In, uh, 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 no, actually, in this case, I would say that all of them. There, there is a slight difference, but otherwise, there is really uh, the fact that this one is increasing at a slower rate than this is actually telling you something about uh, 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 about this being a stricter measure of information content than the other entropies. There are these different measures. Like, for example, let me just tell you a very... Uh, that is, that is no, let me tell you from a mathematical point of view. We can measure information actually the way we like. The question is that... All so, they, they all tell you... The difference of them is yeah. based on the physical Okay, uh, maybe, I, maybe I tell you this, it might not satisfy your physical uh, uh, content of this, but let me just say the following. This is the von Neumann entropy, whereas the other one is governed by, let's say, the uh, linear entropy. And let me write down even one more, the square root of lambda, which I'm not showing here. So, what is clear from this is that the smaller eigenvalues, so lambda i all lie between 0 and 1. So, the smaller eigenvalues become more important in this case and lesser important in this case and even lesser important in this case. So, what's happening here is that uh, the, uh, you know, you're, you're not looking at, so this is a more coarse-grained uh, 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 entropy. I mean, so it's... the difference between the first and second line is pretty well understood. Yeah. Linear entropy. Yeah, no, the second one is a stripper. That, that was in, uh, that's the entropy. I can easily find out the physical relation between them. Yeah. And uh, the fact that the, load, that the second one is not a, uh, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, I don't understand. Okay, so, but, uh, but the point is that they, they are actually, because we have a rather, uh, you know, we are not looking at the, we are looking at a single number given a spectrum. 
So we have different numbers telling us different, uh, different stories. That's my uh, understanding of that. And of course, we have interpretations of these. OK, so, but uh, let me just, uh, I think I have. Yes. Yeah, no, okay, let me, let me say the following. I think that, for example, the linear entropy has its own, you know, interpretation in terms of quantum, quantum information. So uh, the, the von Neumann entropy is important not because of extensivity in quantum information, but because of another reason. So that is actually the interchangeable, you know, that's the uh, sort of, uh, that comes really in terms of, uh, you know, uh, distilling information. So that is really the measure from, from that point of view. So each of these things has its you know, uh, interpretation in information theory. And uh, in fact, there is a whole host of other ones, like the, yeah. uh, like, you know, the uh, Rene entropies. Yeah, Rene entropies. Each one of them has, some, has something to say. No, no, but each one of them has some motivation, which is, uh, OK, let me just, perhaps I have 10 minutes, Carol? Is that Five minutes, so if you if you allow me, I will. Okay, thanks. <laughs> let me uh, let me come to the theory. So I, as I don't have much time, let me just indicate. Uh, uh, well, this is a normal situation. So let me just. Oh, that's not bad. Nineteen out of thirty. So uh, let me indicate uh, our lines of attacking this particular problem. We wish to whether it's for Neumann or any other entropies, we wish to explain these kind of transitions. And what we do is actually just start from perturbation theory. Humbly, this is usual perturbation theory. From perturbation theory, we can also figure out these eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, and they are written here. These are the interaction uh, matrix elements in terms of the unperturbed, uh, uh, unperturbed basis, K and L. And actually, there are some interesting remarks. The, uh, the unentangled state to begin with is, of course, unentangled, the state to begin with without interaction. And it's already in a Schmidt decomposed form. And it actually remains a Schmidt decomposed form to an excellent approximation as long as, as, long as there's no sym special symmetries in the system. So this is where the fact that actually it's a, 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 the systems are already chaotic comes into play that it remains a Schmidt decomposed form to an excellent approximation after perturbation. So on perturbation. So these things allow us to write this eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue, as this difference, uh, 1 minus this. And the no energy denominators, this is the energy of the state corresponding to the state which you have perturbed. So KL is a fixed state. K and L correspond to the uh, quantum numbers of the separable system which, which you have kept. And this is the, these are the transitions to the other things. And this is the second largest eigenvalue where this eigenvalue, uh, this energy eigenvalue is the closest in energy to this. This is also very natural that this one is governed by transitions to all energy levels, the lambda one, the largest eigenvalue. The second largest is governed by transition only to the closest energy level. And here is where some of these things, this is where it's interesting and important that uh, that the individual subsystems are chaotic comes into play. Namely, these transition matrix elements get distributed in an exponential way, and this is the v square which I which which comes in the uh, uh, which comes in the uh, uh, transition parameter. So v square is simply the average of this 
uh, of diagonal matrix elements. And if you divide by the average, it is simply exponentially distributed. This is coming from the statistical properties of the fact that it's originally also chaotic. And the fact that this is chaotic to begin with, but it's non-integrable means that EKL comes from a Poisson spectrum. So essentially, they are non-interacting. You can think of it as a random non-interacting process. So it's a, it comes from a Poisson spectrum. Also, the results of Carroll and, uh, and, and Cush. So, uh, so, and this transition parameter you can see comes immediately from this because this is giving you the V squared and the, uh, uh, and the mean spacing D. So we'll have to divide by D squared and multiply by D squared, divide by V squared and multiply by V squared. So that's why you have this transition parameter to be given by this. It's essentially coming from a perturbation theory, but as we saw, it's actually a good parameter throughout the transition. So uh, what we do, so we try to make use of these statistical analysis and try to find these largest eigenvalue and the second largest eigenvalue. So that's the parameter taken out. It's w, which has some probability Both W and SJ. SJ is also a random Poisson process. The energy eigenvalues are also randomly. Yeah. But in the W is that defined by the V and mu square or whatever in the small v is, yeah. is a given quantity. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So what, what do you mean this? This uh, D? What, what does it mean that W is distributed as E to minus W? Is this probability? This yeah, that's a probability density. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a probability density of this quantity which is actually coming from a Gaussian because this it, it's just telling you that the real part and imaginary part are independent normal normal distribution. So the sum square goes as e to the power minus w. So it's not the v which is, uh, not the coupling constant which is run uh, Well, it is, and that's where the yeah, modulus it's, square is. It's not by itself, I mean, it's, uh, there is this. No, 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 it's not, it's not. No, no. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a disordered system. He will clearly distinguish between these two kind of cases. I can make an assumption that the interaction potential V is statistical. It have a right, number. right, right. And that is, that is what the, the distinguishes the Anderson localization from the other. Yes, but this is a completely different scenario. No, well, um, mathematical is the same. It's the interaction which is which is uh, uh, given as in, which has a certain probability. No, but uh, oh, there's a, there's a, a, sorry, there's a, there's a very important difference here. There is a coupling from every state to every other state, whereas in an Anderson, it's only a nearest neighbor uh, interaction. But the, but, the, 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 but the physically, we have a Hamiltonian plus a interaction. And there are two cases, one where the interaction is random, Right. And the second is where if, when the free energy is random. Yeah. And that, these are clearly different things, physically. And it doesn't matter how they interact. It's a question whether they're potential or the free energy. And I, I just wanted to understand what happens here. Now I understood it. Yes. The free energy, which is random. That's it. OK, good. So uh, the, uh, the, if, if, if you were to continue using this perturbation theory, and use the fact that these are you know, statistically distributed according to the uh, e to the minus w and sj's is a Poisson process, what you will find is that these integrals all diverge because of the two energy levels can come very close to each other. And th in fact, there is a, this, is a, uh, this, is a, this is an important problem, but it can be got rid of in a, in a way by what is called regularization in this scheme where we take into account that when two levels come very close to each other, we treat them specially and essentially like a two by two problem. So we treat every uh, two levels which come close by each other, replace it by this regularization. And then what we see is that these integrals converge and the largest eigenvalue average, which means that you can think of it as a spectral average, No, 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 sorry. From where this definition of the probability density 
No, no, that, it's independent of this W distribution. The problem is with S. The S equal to zero is the problem. Is it independent on which level? Yeah, 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 of course, yes, that's, that's independent. So, uh, okay, so the, let me just state, I think as I have one minute. Oh, yes. So I, I just state the main results. The, the largest eigenvalue is uh, different from one by a square root of lambda. You see, the, if you were to proceed with just the usual perturbation theory, you would think that the largest eigenvalue deviates by something which is of the order of lambda. But that's the, it's an in interesting thing that actually it deviates by square root of lambda. And the second eigenvalue also is of the order of square root of lambda. And the third eigenvalue, largest eigenvalue you can estimate, is a lower order. It's of the order of lambda, log lambda. So, um, okay, so as, I, as my title says something about power laws, I would just like to indicate here where they come from. So, they would, so if, you, if you look at, for example, in the case of the second largest eigenvalue, we take a combination like this. So this is lambda 2, the second largest eigenvalue. That's the transition parameter. We define a new variable g, which is a combination like this. It turns out that the distribution of this, based on the distributions of w and u, goes as a power law with 1 over g to the power of 3 halves. The exact distribution is this. For large g, it goes as this. What does it mean? It means that actually there are several. You see here, large g is when lambda 2 is close to 1 half. So when the second largest eigenvalue is very large, that means that the, f the largest eigenvalue is also close to a half, because both of them sum to nearly one, you have a large probability of that happening. And it's actually going like a power law. And it's going as three, three halves. And, uh, 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 and the largest eigenvalue, going to this largest eigenvalue, the difference of one minus the largest eigenvalue goes as a sum of fat-tailed variables, each of them going as a power law, one over x to the power three halves. And so we can apply a central limit theorem, a generalized version of the central limit theorem, and what we actually find is that the largest eigenvalue, in particular the a combination of the largest eigenvalue, which is a function like this, itself obeys the stationary Levy distribution. There are three uh, stationary or stable distributions whose elementary forms are known, I mean, which are known in elementary forms, the Cauchy, the normal, and the Levy. It turns out that, uh, luckily, the largest eigenvalue is essentially governed by the Levy distribution. So here I show you a, not the Levy distribution itself, but the distribution of 1 over square root of x, which is just a semi-normal distribution. So this is, again, for the standard maps, the largest eigenvalue you can see from data as well as from the theory which comes from this Levy distribution. This is actually the semi-normal. The fits are pretty good. Small values of lambda. The transition parameter is small. Again, these are two highly, cup, uh, highly uh, chaotic systems. So the K1 and K2 are large, 9 and 10. And this is the second largest eigenvalue, which has this distribution, which is 1 over 3 by 2 distributed. So uh, I think I will, uh, 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 so I, I want to say that not only the largest and smallest, but also all these entropies can be calculated using perturbation theory. And we have exact analytic results for how they deviate in the, uh, so for example, the, all the entropies, S alpha, they have this, uh, uh, they have this coefficient in front, which is an easily calculable one. So in particular, the von Neumann entropy increases as pi to the 3 halves square root of lambda, the linear entropy by this. I will not talk about this because I'm at the end of the talk. And the non-perturbative regime, all this was perturbative. The non-perturbative regime has its own story, but quite interestingly, it's simply like an exponential. So we have these things here. It looks like it's a first term in an exponential. So this one here looks like a first term in the exponential. So that's effectively what this is. And the C alpha are governed by this gamma functions. 
and this S infinity are these random matrix values which it limits to. So in fact, this is the analytic curve which I showed you early on when I showed you these results uh, of, uh, mm, these are these analytic results. So these are these exponential fits which start from perturbation theory and go to random matrix theory. In this regime, it's all governed by power laws. In this regime, it's governed by random matrix theory. For example, the largest eigenvalue here is governed by the Levy distribution. Here is governed by the Tracy V. Dome distribution. So it's totally different kind of distributions. So I wish to conclude. So non-interacting but chaotic or non-integrable systems when coupled shows a universal transition. So I wish to emphasize that it all depends only on lambda. Once you calculate lambda for a system, it's completely universal in eigenvalue fluctuations as well as in entanglement production that is rapid, simple, and is governed by the same transition parameters level fluctuation. I didn't talk, I didn't have time to emphasize the uh, fact about when this would actually break down. It breaks down essentially in quantities like that. And the distribution of the largest eigenvalue starts off as a Levy distribution near the uncoupled case to the Tracy V. Dome extreme value statistics in the strongly coupled case. And distributions of other quantities are also heavy tailed. For example, the distribution of linear entropies. So, Many open questions obviously exist and interesting ones which have not been addressed. Coupling integrable systems or intermediate ones, many body systems, for example, how much of this can be uh, seen in, uh, uh, in, in the kind of many body localization transitions uh, remains to be seen. So thank you very much. And uh, my institute, apart from faculty, also has a lot of monkeys and deers. You're welcome if you come there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments, remarks? Yes. So, uh, if I understood correctly, that all these formulas will be defined for uh, component given spaces which are of finite dimension. So, how far we could go if we uh, consider the cold table given spaces? What? What? How far we could go with this formalism if we increase the dimensionality to countable? Countable. Okay. Yes. Here, and this arbitrary can, can go to infinity, but it's still countable. Yes. Yes. It yes. is, by the way, closely rela related to Kostovsky's question because if you want to approximate infinite dimensional by finite dimensional, then you, uh, yeah, uh, for instance, you are able to. Go to the limit with the, with von Neumann entropy well, because it is uh, extensive. Uh, extensive, whereas with other uh, entropies, I'm afraid it will. No, no, but some of any entropies are also extensive. Uh, however, uh -huh. I understand that the definition of entropy is one thing, and the uh, formalism which was. Uh, so maybe I can uh, maybe I can try to answer that. So we have worked, for example, with uh, with coupled. Uh, Quartic, quartic oscillators. I mean, the dimensionalities are infinite, really. Uh, so there also there is an entanglement, uh, entanglement transition. And there, the, the, the role of n, the dimensionality is played essentially by the participation ratio of the states. I mean, the, there, is a, there is an effective dimensionality in which the state is. So it is, it is actually governed by that. For example, the page formula or the, you know, the, the the, uh, the random matrix formula. So what would be the typical entanglement? Log n minus half. What n do I use there? What dimensionality? So there, actually, the, it's, it's, it's effectively you can, you, can use, uh, uh, you can use the participation ratio of the, of the states in that case, because that governs an effective dimensionality of your system, which is still finite. Uh, let me also clarify that uh, this was not fed to the monkey. The monkey grabbed it, yes. I believe. So, okay. So, <laughs> no, you're not allowed to feed. 
Bem-vindo.